We are the core coders. Andrew Wendling is our team leader. My name is Chris Rappler. I was the project architect. Jonathan Hyrie was our lead developer. Nathan Gersman was our lead tester. And Homer Younger was our quality assurance. Right, we were working with Dr. Megan Walsh from the Central Washington University Geography Department. And most of you should already be familiar with our advisor, Dr. Hendrick. So I'm going to go over a quick review of why we're doing the project, some of the equipment we use and interface with. Uh, Nathan will then go over the, our past work up until the middle of this quarter, which will be our first two milestones. And then Omri will take over and give you a detail on the work we've done since our last presentation in our third and final milestone. Andrew will then take over to, uh, to explain our testing procedures, give you some insight into our processes, validate our program validity. And then uh, John will give you a, a demonstration of the new features we've added since our last presentation and show you a quick video of those features in the lab. And then we'll go back to Nate, who will give you a comparison of the old software's output data and compare to ours and explain what we've improved, how we've actually kept some things from the previous one. Just, and uh, then I'll come back and open up the floor for questions. All right, I'm sure anyone who's seen our previous presentation can remember these pictures. So the, the geography department goes out to goes out the bottom of the field pulls a, a big column of mud out of the bottom of the lake. So you can see the, one of those at the bottom up there. Now they, they're interested in the magnetic susceptibility of these organ cores, and they are actually divided down into about 100 centimeter lengths called drives, or more easy, two more easily managed them. But they're interested in this magnetic susceptibility, and the way they read this is they feed these drives through the brain reader in the bottom left here, and that will take samples, uh, magnetic samples, at about one centimeter intervals and give you a map along the entire core of this magnetic susceptibility body. And But sometimes they need a much more accurate reading. So they'll, <coughs> they will um, slice off one of those one centimeter sections from the core, put it into the cup. You see these steps in the top left here. Put that up into the cup reader and then that gives them much more, much higher precision than the uh, rear reader. Both of these readers are actually driven by the SI2 box in the top left. And this box is what our software actually interfaces with over a serial port. So I'm going to hand it off to Nate to go over our previous iterations. Uh, our, for our first milestone, our, uh, we translated the Pascal code that consisted of the original program into C++, C++ code for uh, lo uh, longevity and high ma maintainability. And we included all the necessary functions and uh, math mathematical and other functions uh, to the new program. And we enhanced it with input validation to avoid user error. And we completed this last quarter. And for our second milestone, we added C Sharp user interface uh, to the C++ uh, so that we could include such features as uh, graphing Windows forms, controls, uh, viewing and verifying data, saving to CSVs, and reviewing changing core drive info. And we uh, completed this earlier this quarter. Okay. Uh, we've just completed our third and final iteration. We've added some new features, which I'll expand on in a moment. We conducted several types of testing, uh, including extensive acceptance and user testing, unit testing, and white and black box testing. Uh, as a result of this, we found several bugs, such as several in our saving procedures and summarizing from our lack of button flow control. As I mentioned, we've added several new features to our program in the last month. We've added the ability to add notes to a core, storing specific information pertaining to that core. Uh, we've added the ability for the user to enter the water depth. This is the depth down to where the core actually starts, and that will give the user a much more understandable number. Uh, 
Uh, we added the ability for the user to both delete and clear samples. Uh, these two are distinct. Clearing a sample resets it so that it can be retaken. Deleting a sample removes it from both the drive and the CSV. Uh, 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 clearing a sample is useful if a sample is taken in error, if, uh, if something that isn't supposed to be there is within the reader, and deleting a sample is useful if there are pieces missing from a drive, which can't be, uh, that, which can't be shown automatically. Uh, we also added the ability for the user to review and change their core information in the middle of the session. Uh, in the course of our testing, we found several bugs. Our saving procedure was not saving things in order of their depths, and some items were being saved in the wrong places, and we fixed this. And the final <coughs> results of that will be shown later. Our file loading procedure was off as well, and that has also been fixed. Our graphing utility didn't display all our data points, and some were cut off, but uh, we enhanced a lot of our, the functionality for our graphing, and that fixed the problem. Uh, our program has very definite flow. Things have to happen in a certain order, and if they're not done in the correct order, they break the program, and they do the wrong things. So we fixed most of those problems so that they would not happen, and we also added a lot of enabling and disabling of buttons so that things can only happen in the order with which they should be done. Our also, client also requested that sample depths be changed so that the depth of, of a sample was the depth at the end of the sample, and we've done this. I'll now hand you over to Andrew, who will go over our testing procedures. All right, so we had milestone one and two, and about a month ago, we gave them milestone three. For the first week, we had release candidate one, and that was what our team used. We went in every day for about a week and took our own samples. And with those, we could compare them to the old data, because they had previous data from the Pascal code. So we team tested it, uh, made sure that everything was working good enough that we could make it through an entire drive, one of those chunks of mud, and then we made a few changes. From that, we made revision, or release candidate, I guess that's what we're calling them, 3.2. This one was actually used by grad students and the team. Uh, we had bug forms that they would fill out, sometimes when they felt like it. Most of the time they just told us uh, verbally what they want changed, and then that came back and we fixed that up. And release candidate three will be the final one, or is the final one, that they've been using for about two weeks now. Uh, it's made it through three, 3.1, 3.2, and I think 3.3 is the final version that they're using at the moment. Uh, this has been used by grad students and professors. Uh, as you'll see later, there's a, uh, there's a name on one of them, Tammy. She's one of the other professors in the department, and she does all kinds of stuff. She's made it through about seven drives worth of data now. So we know it's working. She's happy with it. Other than that, there were some minor fixes and some formatting, just some changes in the words. For our types of testing, we had acceptance testing for that whole month, three weeks-ish, that our client used it and the, that the users have used it. For unit testing, we've written a whole bunch of methods. Not 100% of them were tested, but some of them were hard to, like the graphing, for example. Those are done through visual testing, where we took the graphs from the previous version and we compared them to the graphs from the new version and they line up with the same curves, and you'll see that also uh, during Nate's part in a second. For the C++ side, we had our debug output that you guys saw at midterms, with the big, huge, scrolling white text, uh, the command line output that was all of the serial connections coming and going. Uh, we have the end-to-end -end emulator setup, which we can put in any numbers we want into a text file, and we can emulate having the box to a certain degree. It allows us to test certain things. We also have a program called Hercules, which allows us to change the data coming and going from a serial connection. So we can view it, inject certain bytes into the program that we want. For our white box, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we went in, we did our own testing. Uh, we've run through the program both with the, in the, both with the emulator and in the lab when we did our own sample taking. And then black box is the one we're actually really proud about. From about three weeks ago when we gave it to him, we gave it to Megan, our advisor, and she wasn't actually able to, uh, or we weren't actually able to talk to any of the people who were going to use this thing. It was a bunch of grad students who would come in later in the day, or other professors who were busy with classes. We never actually got to talk to everybody on how it worked. So, with, uh, with no knowledge, other than the knowledge of how the old Pascal worked, they knew generally what a drive was, 
was, what a core was, some basic terms. Uh, we were really happy with our flow of our program and just the quality of it that they have been able to take, as we said, about seven at least, that was a couple days ago, drives worth of data, uh, with very few crashes, uh, and the few that they did manage to have the cabin, we fixed them uh, in 3.2 and the earlier versions of 3.3. And now John will show you what it actually does. All right. First I'll be demonstrating the actual application, and then after that I'll be showing you a video of the machine and the application actually working together. And this time around you'll be seeing the cup reader instead of the ring reader, which you saw at midterms for all of you that were here. Okay. So one thing that you'll notice is different is instead of having the core description that you enter at first, we now have an actual login box. So every time somebody comes to use the program and takes samples, you their name actually gets attached to each sample that's taken so that not only do you know who created the core, you also know who took each sample. So I'm just going to log into a session here. Well, actually, there's no session loaded yet. But so we can load a session from any CSV file that this program has produced, or if they really want to take the time to make their own CSV that actually adheres to the standards of the program, then they're free to do that. But as you can see, all the samples populated in the list and the graph as well. This particular session is not complete. It was a session that we actually got from the geography department in Dean Hall. And um, so next I will show you about one of the new features is notes. Some notes previously there from me actually practicing the presentation, in that it saves the notes to the CSV file when you click OK on here, which goes along with the autosave fu functionality where when you take a sample, it automatically saves that to the CSV file as well. All right, and another new feature is our core info, which you can, before, you could only enter this the first time when you created when you created a session or a new core, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, but now you can view and edit the information during a session, anytime you need to. Um, you'll also notice here, I think we showed this last time, you can um, you can either view the whole core in the graph or you can change between the drives in the core. This is where they stop taking samples. And it appears here that um, one of the samples is erroneous, which happens occasionally. It's a scientific instrument, and it's not perfect. But hmm? well, it, it, I mean, they might have like not had the drive in the right place, or something else might have been in the reader and they didn't know or really close to it as well, because it's extremely sensitive to magnetic fields. Which is where the, uh, the clear, as Omri told you, the clear sample functionality comes in very handy when things like that happen. So you don't have to like recreate the drive or anything. You can just clear the sample and retake it. So I'm going to save this portion of the graph, just save it to the desktop. And uh, the graph saves as a JPEG file. And as you can see, it's actually the background of these saves is actually translucent. So if somebody wanted to apply a background behind this and like layer it in Photoshop or something, they could do that. And, uh, as you see, it's actually what you see on there. And you can also save the graph with a full core. So, saving the graph is literally what you see is what you get. So, right there. Mm -hmm. Alright, so I'm going to conclude this session, save it, and then save and exit. And 
the next one we'll move on to the video. So this is going to look really familiar, the new logging box that we have. Okay, Andrew is logging in. He's going to create a new folder here, and we'll be using the cover reader, as you'll see, a little picture in picture that will come up when we take a sample. All your core information is entered. You can, and then after you create the core, you can enter your drive information for the piece of mud that you're going to be working with. And then you just click add, and the sample list populates completely. And now, at this point, you can take samples and edit all of the information as you desire. So here, also displaying notes functionality that we added. Save the save the CSV file from the program. <coughs> and then after this, you'll actually also see that you can export the notes from the CSV file to a text file by itself, or you can also import a text file into the CSV as a notes section. So here we're going to actually take a sample. See so here is the logger box and the cover. So we take a very and then put the little cup full of mud in the reader here. You can barely see it, but the little light is on on the box. It comes on and flashes on and off. And when it flashes on, that means it's actually taking a reading. So we'll take another air reading. And as you can see, the sample value populates, as well as the point on the graph up in the upper right corner of the application. And we save the file. And save and exit. And that session is concluded. Somebody can come back to it any time by loading that CSV file back into the program. And that concludes our video. And I will now hand it off to me. samples from the old uh, program, all drive data, all the samples taken from each drive was saved in separate CSVs, thus the first drive would be saved in one CSV, drive two in another, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Our program fixed that problem by taking all the information, the user name, the uh, core name, and all the drives and all the samples on, are put onto a single CSV for uh, simple loading and uh, space saving. On our graph, uh, the old program had to open the graph in an Excel program, and the points that were that represent the samples are not easily detectable on the Excel program. Whereas our graph, you can see each sample represented by the square points, and they all form a uh, uniform line, easily readable. All right. So as you can see, our program is quite functional. Uh, it does everything our client wants it to do. Uh, because the client's happy, we're happy. And uh, hopefully our advisor will be happy as well. <laughs> so uh, we're pretty confident that it is complete at this point. At about, I believe it's, re it's revision 220, or commit number 220, rather. And that's about 8,000 lines of code. So we're pretty happy with the, the minimal compact nature of the so right now, if anyone has any questions, we'll do our best to answer those. Questions? Dr. Swain? Yes, on the, uh, I, I, I wasn't quite sure of the words that you said, but there's an information about whatever sample or test is to The magnetic susceptibility? You, you made it so that it's editable during the the run of the core. The core, yeah, they yeah. have. It's in a session. So, so my question is, is it appropriate to, to track the changes that are being written there? I mean, uh, somebody's changed something in that file. Is that, you may want to know if that's an appropriate change or? That might be a, be a good idea. You could, you could actually implement that with, a, with like, we like a version control system. Right, it's a version, but tag it with the name that 
of the person who changed it, right? Right. Um, that wasn't a feature requested by our client, and we didn't think about it. The, the editing of the core information should only happen if there's like an error in the core information. It's, it's pretty stable information. It shouldn't, right. shouldn't change. They can look it up in physical records uh, as well. So it won't, it's it won't actually break anything. When you change all that, it won't break any loading or saving. Uh, all the loading of the samples is based on the those four drive uh, metadata and all the other stuff. The ones at the top are almost cosmetic. They don't really uh, affect the data in any way. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Yellow. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, you wrote about 8,000 lines of code. Some of it was C++ and some of it was the user interface in C Sharp. Do you have any guesstimate on the percentage that was this core C++ versus uh, the, the Actually, user we, we had different teams working on different portions of it. So I don't think any one of us is entirely sure how much is in one versus the other. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm personally familiar with the C++ side in the, in, in the DLL. But I, I didn't do much work in the, the user interface side, so I'm not sure how much I was there. I'd say about a third of it is C++, and the rest of it is C Sharp. And in terms of time, was it about 50-50 for the time versus? Most of last quarter, pretty much all of last quarter was C++. Right. A little bit of this one, and then, yeah, about half, probably. Um, you guys saw a basic version of midterms, and that only, we'd only done a little bit of work. Well, no, I can't say that. <laughs> Probably two thirds on the C, a third on the C sharp. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any anything else?